James Acre Hackney III. And your birth date? September 27, 1939. And uh, you were the oldest of five, five children. children. Yes. Tell us about your parents. What were their names? My dad was James Acre Hackney Jr. My mother was Margaret Hodges Hackney, uh, both Washingtonians. Uh, dad attended the University of North Carolina studying electrical engineering. Uh, left after three years to marry my mother. Uh, mother was two years younger than dad and had attended secretarial school in Greensboro. And the two of them eloped to South Carolina. And at the time I was born, dad was driving an ice cream truck for a living. Oh my gosh. Uh, your grandparents also lived in Washington. Tell yes. us a little bit about that. The, uh, on mother's side, her parents were Ralph Hodges and Maud Hodges, and her dad was uh, a farmer, a merchant, a banker, and a politician. Okay. Uh, he grew up in a farm family and had a farm on North Market Street. He was a partner in a dry goods store, uh, Suskin and Berry, which was next door to where the Hackney restaurant now stands in downtown Washington, formerly the Bank of America building. And when I was born, he was the mayor of Washington and also was one of the founders of the Guarantee Bank and Trust Company, which became Wachovia, which was uh, acquired by Wachovia. On the other side, my paternal grandfather, James Hackney Sr., was born in Wilson, one of seven children, uh, three boys, four boys and, and three girls, and uh, came to Washington to work with his brother managing the branch plant from the Wilson Company. My grandmother was the daughter of a Washington merchant, Ebenezer Ayers, and uh, she was one of five children, three girls, two boys. Uh, both my paternal grandparents born in 1890 my maternal grandparents, born in 1895, grandfather, and 1897, grandmother. And Jim, I think it's important to tell people that uh, actually, probably the start of uh, what ended up being uh, Hackney Manufacturing started in Wilson, North Carolina, uh, in the early 1850s with uh, uh, Hackney Wagon and Buggy Works there. Is that is that correct? Yes. 1852, my great great-grandfather and a partner started a buggy manufacturing firm which really was following a family tradition which dated back to the 1600s in England. Uh, the company was originally Parker and Hackney. Uh, eventually Parker left and it was just my great-great-grandfather. When his first son was born, uh, it became Hackney and Son there when the second son was born, he changed the name to Hackney Brothers, and that was the name that survived until the 1990s. The, uh, uh, all, all of the sons except John Hackney were part of that company in my grandfather's generation. In 1908, they had grown to the point that they uh, established a branch plant in Washington and first, my great uncle George, and then my grandfather uh, came to Washington to manage that operation, which is how my grandfather ended up in Washington. He married a Washington girl and uh, ended up staying here. Well, and I think it's uh, notable for people to know that uh, the Wilson operation uh, for that time had a rather significant output as far as the number of wagons and buggies they manufactured each year. Yes, it did, and I don't remember the Well, there are various numbers, estimates, yeah. but between twelve and 15,000 a year between their various operations, and in 1900, that's a lot. It was. Yeah. If you have 20 work days and you're doing 12,000 vehicles, uh, you know, you can do the math pretty quickly. Uh, you're, you're making quite a few buggies or wagons each day, and uh, that's that's of note. So uh, your grandfather comes to Washington, an extension of the Wilson plant. Uh, we fast forward and uh, want to talk, uh, jump back and talk about 
uh, you growing up. Talk about growing up in Washington and where you went to school and some of the items, what you were interested in. Well, uh, I began in elementary school at John Small Elementary, which was only two blocks from my home. Washington was a relatively uh, s small town then. I was born at Fowl Memorial Hospital, which was across the street from where I ended up living most of my youth. Uh, I attended Washington High School, which was one block farther than John Small Elementary, so I was able to walk the uh, roughly three blocks to school every day. Uh, my primary entries growing up, I would say that uh, dominated everything was the Boy Scouts. Uh, was involved first in the Cub Scouts, then the Boy Scouts, then Explorers, and it introduced me to a wide variety of interest through the merit badge system. And it also was a great leadership training experience. So I attribute much of what uh, I was interested in and much of what I was able to do later in life uh, in significant part to the Boy Scouts. You uh, also um, are a musician, and uh, did you start those interests? When did you start playing music? Both of my grandmothers, amazingly enough, were college graduates in music. They both uh, graduated from Greensboro College. Mother's parents lived next door to us. Uh, Dad's parents lived across the street and one block down. Uh, needless to say, both had pianos. And eventually we ended up with a piano. So pianos were always available. And evidently I inherited the musical ability from my grandparents uh, to play by ear. So growing up, I never had music lessons, <clears throat> which I now regret considerably. But uh, I was always able to, uh, to play things by ear. I have a brother who really doesn't have that much musical talent that took piano lessons for a year. And later, uh, about 15 years ago, when I actually got into music to learn it, I asked my mother uh, why he ended up uh, taking piano, and I didn't. And her reply was, well, you could always play everything. We didn't think you needed music lessons. <laughs> and you told me something, you shared something interesting with me uh, about your grandmother uh, as far as being uh, the organist uh, for many, many years at two different churches. Tell us, tell us about that. She was uh, the organist for 41 years at First Methodist Church in Washington. And I might add without pay then, because organists make pretty good money today. Uh, but she also was the organist at the Beebe Memorial uh, Methodist Church, which was primarily African American. And she did that for many, many years also without pay. Uh, you were asking also about uh, youth, and I should mention one other thing. Uh, from a sports standpoint, uh, I was not large enough to be a football player, but beginning my junior year, I was <clears throat> the, <clears throat> the spotter uh, for the uh, announcer who covered the Washington High School football games. So for two years, I got to go to every football game and of course, to learn the, uh, the strategy, the uh, intricacies of football, and have been a football fan ever since at all levels. And I also began at about 15 playing golf, so I was able to play on the high school golf team my senior year. So in high school, you uh, played golf, uh, you were interested in music, you were involved in the Boy Scouts. Um, and photography. And that, photography. The one that I neglected to mention because uh, I began at age 12 with an interest in photography, got into darkroom work, uh, and my senior year also I was the photographer for the school annual. Wow. Wow. So after high school, what did you do? Uh, went to North Carolina State University, which at that time was the North Carolina State College of Agriculture and Engineering, now NC State University. Uh, began in electrical engineering. And again, I need to go back to the other hobby, and that is ham radio. Because when I was 15, I got my ham radio license, which began a lifelong interest in electronics. So I began in electrical engineering. Uh, at that time, the, uh, 
the business here in Washington was quite small. When I say quite small, we're talking 10, 12 employees. Uh, as the business began to grow, uh, after my freshman year, I decided that a more practical major was mechanical engineering. And so I changed my major from electrical engineering, which was mostly a hobby, to mechanical engineering, which seemed like a more logical profession given the family tradition. Well, let's talk about uh, the uh, Hackney manufacturing business uh, for a little bit. Let's get people up to date. Your grandfather continued for uh, a long period of time, but there was a hiatus uh, in Hackney Manufacturing. Talk a little bit about that and, and how your dad uh, got back into the business. My grandfather, as I mentioned, had come to Washington with his brother to manage the Wilson branch plant. In 1922, there was a fire at the Wilson plant which destroyed the machinery department. And they needed immediately machinery to continue manufacturing in Wilson. <clears throat> and so they closed the Washington plant and moved all of that equipment back to Wilson. My grandfather had married a Washington girl who didn't want to move to Wilson. And so she persuaded him to leave the family firm. And he was in several brokerage businesses, primarily sugar, <clears throat> uh, up until the beginning of the Depression when things collapsed. And at that point, the Wilson Company was still doing well. So he went on the payroll of the, of the Wilson Company as a traveling salesman, which he could do from Washington. He did that until the beginning of World War II, at which time virtually all of the output of the Wilson Company was for the military. So he was still on the payroll as a salesman, but since he didn't have anything to sell, he began uh, an operation building buggies for farmers in eastern North Carolina who still used them because of the gas shortage during World War II. So these were horse-drawn buggies? <clears throat> yes. So the Hackney Buggy Company in Washington. Was back in business in? Uh, with my grandfather and one other employee. In 1946? Well, really in 1941. A little before that. Yes. So during the war, uh, that's what he was doing. Okay. And how does your father blend into all this? Dad, as I mentioned, when I was born, uh, was uh, driving an ice cream truck, yes. which he did until the beginning of World War II. Uh, Dad had a background in electrical engineering, as I mentioned. And so when the war began, he got a job with North Carolina Shipbuilding uh, in Wilmington, North Carolina, and worked there for six months. Uh, six months later, he moved, or the family moved, to St. Augustine, Florida, and he, Dad went to work for uh, St. John's Shipbuilding in Jacksonville. That lasted six months. Then it was back to Wilmington for six months, back to Jacksonville for six months. Uh, at that point, uh, he enlisted in what was then the Army Transportation Corps as a refrigeration mechanic on a hospital ship, uh, and that's where he served for the remainder of World War II. Okay. So that gets us a little further up to speed about the operations in Washington. Let's go back to uh, your studies at NC State. Um, you get your degrees. Yes, well, uh, as I mentioned, I was on track for a mechanical engineering yes. degree. Uh, I then decided that I needed uh, some experience in the, uh, the courses that led to, to management. So I debated between going to Carolina for a one-year master's uh, or getting an industrial engineering degree at NC State, which also took one more year. <coughs> Uh, I looked at the, the courses that I would be able to take and what I would be able to learn rather than the, the prestige of the degree, decided that the industrial engineering degree would be the better choice. So actually, uh, at the end of my sophomore year, I began planning all of my electives in the required courses for an industrial engineering degree. 
Uh, I graduated in 1961 with a mechanical engineering degree. My wife and I got married uh, and then went back to NC State one more year to finish the industrial engineering degree. So did you meet Connie at NC State? No. Uh, I can uh, thank the Boy Scouts for meeting Connie uh, because uh, Connie, is, Connie is from Bethel, North Carolina, which is 30 miles from here. But in 1954, her father built a home on the Pamlico River, and her cousin was in my Boy Scout troop. So Easter weekend of 1956, after a Boy Scout meeting, uh, Connie and her family were spending the weekend in Washington. So my friend, her cousin, and I went down to meet his cousins uh, at their home on the river. Uh, Connie and I met that night, and then for the next five years, that is th our senior year in high school and four years of college, we dated and then were married the week after we each graduated from college. My gosh, <laughs> what a great story. <laughs> well, you never know how that works. No. So, after college, graduated from college, you're married, what happens then? Well, my, uh, when I was in college, the draft was still active. Yes. It was well before the Vietnam War. Uh, NC State was a land grant, is a land grant school. At that time, all land grant schools were required to uh, teach ROTC for two years. Now, explain what a land grant school is for oh. those that may not know. Oh, uh, at the end of the Civil War, uh, the colleges and universities in the United States were primarily liberal arts schools. So the government decided that it was in the interest of the nation to teach agriculture and mechanic arts. So they passed in, I think, 1865, the Morrill Act. The Morrill Act uh, gave government property to uh, universities, hence the land grant, right. uh, with the proviso that they had to teach agriculture and mechanic arts. So NC State was the land-grant school for North Carolina, established in uh, 1887. Uh, there are a lot of well-known land-grant schools. MIT is a land-grant school. Cornell is a land-grant school. Many of the, the colleges with uh, state university in their names are land-grant schools. Mm -hmm. uh, others include Clemson and Auburn. But uh, I've lost where I was. You were talking about uh, some stipulations with land-grant schools. Oh. <clears throat> and the, the draft was going. <clears throat> uh, so my freshman and sophomore year, as was required, I took ROTC. Mm -hmm. uh, I got out of ROTC, had no interest in serving in the military, uh, graduated from college. Uh, but during the years after my ROTC experience, I stayed in touch with the full-time military cadre in the department. Uh, they were, were friends and mentors, and so when they knew that I was getting married, they uh, said, we'll make you an offer you can't refuse. <laughs> uh, said, you know you're going to be drafted, you've got to serve, you don't want to be an enlisted man, you're officer material, so we'll let you compress the third year military science and the fourth year military science in one year uh, and become commissioned and then uh, serve in the Army thereafter. So I took them up on the, the offer, uh, was commissioned in 1962, and then subsequently served two years active duty in the U.S. Army. Well, that was a good way to fulfill your service. Yes. So you fulfilled your service, and um, you're getting ready to come back home and join the company. Well, actually, I began with the company long before then. You did, on a part-time basis. You were at Fort Bragg, I believe. Well, e even before then, because when I started my industrial engineering work, uh, at that time, the company was still 13, 14 employees. Uh, my, it was a learning laboratory. So this was the early 1960s. Well, this was 1959. Yep. So the summer of 1959, I had begun my studies in industrial engineering, which included method study, time study, uh, 
work improvement, and my father gave me free reign to do whatever I wanted during the summer of 1959. So, as I said, the, the company was a learning lab for an industrial engineering student, and between the methods improvement, the time study, and the like, uh, in that with the work that was done that summer over about the next six months, we were able to cut the manufacturing time of a truck body exactly in half, wow. which in effect doubled the size of the, the plant, or doubled the output of the Double plant. The output, yeah. uh, and by that time I had uh, folks working for me, so uh, I was part-time for the next year, and then uh, the year that I was uh, uh, married and getting my additional degree, I was full-time on the payroll and I would come home uh, from Friday afternoon until Saturday evening every weekend uh, to work and manage the manufacturing operation of the company. Now, was this while you were at Fort Bragg? No, well, uh, yes, I did that also at Fort Bragg. Yeah. There was a one-year lapse between when I graduated with my second degree in 1962 and when I went in the Army in the spring of 63. Uh, we tend to think that the government doesn't have a heart, but the engineer who was going to replace me when I went in the Army uh, was drafted himself oh, gosh. and had a six-month tour. Yeah. So the Army gave me a one-year delay uh, going on active duty for him to finish his six months and then for me to have six months to overlap with him before I had to report for active duty. And of course I ended up at Fort Bragg, so I was able to come home Friday afternoons and work Saturday, left my wife and at that time young son at Fort Bragg. And uh, it, uh, it was a busy time, but it was a fun time. So let's talk about uh, when you joined the company full time. Out, you're out of the service. And you moved back to Washington. In 1965. And okay. Essentially, I had been managing the manufacturing end of the company for probably four years. Okay, so it's 1965. How many yes. employees does Hackney Manufacturing have? The, well, I'll go back because when I, when I graduated in 1961, uh, we had 17 employees. And in fact, I... Uh, the way that I knew that I was managing the uh, the manufacturing operation was in the spring of 1961, I was in my dorm room and got a shout from down the hall that I had a phone call. And it was an individual from Wilson, North Carolina, who said he would like to talk with me about a job in production control and, and drafting. And I told him that uh, you'll have to speak to my dad about that, and he said, well, no offense intended, sir, but I've talked with your dad, and he says, you're doing the hiring. Oh, my gosh. So I, that's the roundabout way I discovered that I was in, in uh, full-time management at the company. During the one year that I was out uh, between uh, my second degree and going in the Army, uh, I did a little of everything because dad's brother had also been employed by the company as a salesman. He had the North Carolina and Virginia territory. And he originally was in the newspaper business. Dad's brother was a journalism major at Chapel Hill, uh, nine years younger than my father, and had worked for the High Point Enterprise as a sports editor. Uh, he came to the company in the mid-50s and was there until the early 60s at which time he had the opportunity to buy a newspaper in Florida. So he bought the newspaper and left the family company. So we were, at that time, without a salesman for the North Carolina and Virginia territory. Oh, gosh. So I did that also. And uh, a fortuitous, fortuitous event, one of our longtime customers decided, who incidentally had uh, something like seven manuf uh, soft drink plants, they were in the Seven Up business, uh, decided to completely replace their fleet and lease a brand new fleet. Uh, and I was able to sell them 
a 50 plus unit order, which turned out to be very profitable for the company. Uh, and when I went in the army, I left the company with, with a pretty large order uh, to complete. When I got out in 65, the, uh, I was received my, uh, well, I, I left active duty and went into reserve in, 19, in May of 1965. In July of 1965, without any discussion with my father, Dad called a meeting with me, my brother Hodges, my grandfather, and our longtime plant superintendent, and announced that he was stepping down as general manager and chief operating officer of the company, and that I was going to be it. Wow. So, again, uh, first time I found out that I had that position, but Dad always had a flair for the dramatic, so that was just one more way that uh, uh, that he showed that flair. So, 1965, your primary product that you're manufacturing now are uh, bodies for beverage delivery, is that yes. correct? Yes. Now, let's go back, because I think it's very interesting. When your father came back to Washington from his uh, working in Florida six months and then working in Wilmington six months, he and a partner rented um, part of the what's now Mitchell Tractor Building and started an enterprise, which actually led to you getting in the beverage truck business. Tell us that yeah. story. I had mentioned that my grandfather uh, during World War II was still employed by Hackney Brothers mm -hmm. as a salesman, but had no product to, to sell because everything went to the military. He was still living in Washington, and at that time, farmers in eastern North Carolina, as I mentioned, uh, used were still using horse-drawn buggies uh, because there were uh, many places where there were no roads and, and horse-drawn carts were very practical. Yeah. His daughter had married into the family that owned the Chevrolet distributorship in Washington, which was located at the corner of 3rd Street and Bridge Street in Washington. The company was Go More Chevrolet. It was so the, was it G-O, how, how did they spell G-O hyphen M-O-R-E, because it was the Atmore family. Oh, A okay. A-T-T-M-O-R-E. <clears throat> so the Go More was, uh, I guess, a play on transportation and their name. Wow. But uh, they, there was an unused shed in the back corner of their lot there at 3rd and Bridge. And so my grandfather and one other longtime friend of his, an African-American man by the name of William Cobby Eburn, began building the uh, horse-drawn buggies in that shed in the back corner of the lot, which, as you mentioned, is now... Uh, the Mitchell Tractor uh, location. When Dad came back from the service in 1946, by then he had quite a bit of experience in electrical wiring through his work at the shipyards because that's what he did. He and a longtime friend, Tom Owens, uh, went into partnership in electrical contracting and their operation was out of that shed since my grandfather already had uh, a location that they could use. Now, you had an interesting neighbor across the street. Yes. Uh, across the street was the Dr. Pepper Bottling Company, owned by the William Robertson family. Uh, in the early days of the electrical contracting business, uh, many of the industrial components that you needed, you had to make. You couldn't buy them, and that required welding. So, Mr. W. R. Robertson, Sr., uh, walked across the street and asked my father if he could use their welding capability to repair some of his equipment that had gone through World War II without repairs. Uh, Dad and the employee there who uh, had been doing the welding did in fact repair the truck bodies and evidently did such a good job that the following year, Mr. Robertson asked if they would consider building a beverage body. Uh, they did, and evidently the quality of the beverage body was very good, so Mr. Robertson 
uh, was happy enough that he began telling his fellow bottlers in eastern North Carolina that the Hackneys were in the beverage body business. So, and uh, to let everyone know, uh, the Robertson Beverage Company, they had their own brand, Robertson Drinks. Yes. They had Dr. Pepper. Yes. They had Canada Dry and some other drinks. Yes. And they were, uh, they were a very uh, big concern. They were a big, uh, large employer here, uh, delivered drinks in a large area. And uh, the steel-bodied truck that your father and his group built was the first beverage delivery truck that the Hackney Manufacturing Company ever made. About what year would that have been? The repairs were done in 46, mm -hmm. so the first manufacturing was in 1947. All because what he was better known as, Daddy Bill Robertson, yes. came across the street and uh, got a few repairs and said, you know, maybe you guys can build us a truck to deliver our drinks on. Yes. <laughs> and by, by the end of 1947, uh, my father and grandfather realized that the beverage body industry would be their future. And so dad sold the electrical contracting uh, business, that is his share of the partnership, uh, to his partner. Uh, they purchased uh, they being my father and grandfather, purchased some property on Hackney Avenue, which actually was a part of the property that the old Hackney uh, buggy company had until it closed in 1922, built a building and began building beverage bodies at Hackney Avenue and 4th Street. That actually was the start of Hackney Manufacturing building uh, beverage delivery trucks. Yes. It was a partnership originally Hackney and Son, and as I mentioned, uh, in about 1955, my uncle, Dad's brother, joined it, and it became Hackney and Sons. Oh. So let's fast forward to 1965. Um, beverage business is picking up. You've, in a meeting and uh, that your father calls and assembles all the powers that be, he announces unbeknownst to you that you are now the chief operating officer of the company, the new guy in charge, and he is stepping down. Yes. Well, that's for, for a young lad, let's see, at that point in time, how old would you have been? Coming up on 26. 26, and you're running uh, Hackney, and Brother, Hackney Brothers, and uh, through different well, names, Hack, Hackney yeah, Manufacturing. Yes, well, ha at, at, at that time, it was Hackney and Sons. Okay, so in 1965, how many uh, beverage delivery trucks would you make in a year? At that point, probably 200. 200. So let's tell people how that worked. I think it's interesting how your supply chain was. So you manufactured the bodies for the delivery trucks with all of the compartments where you put drinks in, but you needed truck chassis. Yes. And your customers didn't all want the same kind of truck. You had a relationship with a couple of uh, 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 auto dealers. T tell us who those were and how that worked. Okay, first of all, it would help to talk about how the process worked. Okay. Uh, and going back, there was an evolution of the design of, of beverage bodies because in the 40s, beverage bodies were open. Uh, they were hand loaded. Uh, they had slides that ran across the, uh, the body and eat one case at a time was loaded in. By the end of the war, uh, there was a, a, an evolution in materials handling. The forklift arrived on the scene. So soft drinks were uh, stored and loaded on pallets that were lifted by forklifts. Uh, it was no longer uh, economically practical to hand load one case at a time. So uh, there evolved a, what was known as a pallet body, which was essentially a big cargo bay where the forklift could load the uh, entire pallet of soft drinks onto the truck without individually handling each case. Uh, that was fine, except uh, by roughly the time that I began to be involved in the company, uh, there was a need for uh, the truck bodies to be enclosed. Uh, 
cans arrived on the scene. Cans were pack, packed in paper cartons. So couldn't uh, get wet. Yeah, driving in the rain yeah. didn't work. So there was a need for overhead doors. Yeah. Uh, so during the time actually that uh, uh, I was getting involved from the end of my college years uh, and through my army years, we were developing the overhead door truck body, which had another benefit for the bottler because it was a rolling billboard. Mm -hmm. So instead of being open, you had something you could put your signage on. Yes. And uh, then about the time I got out of the army, the, the trend was to larger and larger vehicles. Uh, so uh, we, we designed a, uh, a trailer, a route trailer, that was towed behind the vehicle. But going back to the process, normally what would happen would be that our salesman would go to the soft drink bottler or beer distributor, because we did both, and sell him the truck body. He would buy a truck from his local truck dealer because he wanted it serviced locally. Uh, the truck dealer would order it from Detroit or Springfield or Louisville or wherever it was manufactured and have it sent, known as drop shipped, to our plant here in Washington. Uh, when we received the, the truck, we would build the truck body we actually extensively modified the frame of the truck so that we could get the, the, the payload down low enough that it was easy for the, uh, the route salesman to unload. Yeah, you needed it lower. Yeah. Uh, we would mount the body on the truck, paint it, letter it, and deliver it to the bottler. Wow. So the first time he actually saw his unit, uh, it was ready to go on the route the next day uh, with just minimal uh, uh, maintenance. Now, there are a lot of options today. If you were building a, uh, a beverage delivery uh, truck, uh, as far as the types of chassis and things, but there were two primary manufacturers that you dealt with at that time. Sure. Well, part of our problem... Ford and well, Chevy. Yeah, but part of our problem uh, with that process is that we were at the mercy of the supply chain, for, that is, from the bottler ordering from his local truck right. dealer to it being manufactured in Detroit or Louisville or... Had to be in order. So how did you overcome that? The, uh, well, again, our problem was all of the trucks seemed to arrive at the same time, or sometimes they wouldn't arrive in time for the bottler to use them when he needed them. Mm -hmm. So the solution to that problem was to have a stock of truck chassis that we could make available to the, the bottler or beer distributor. So they didn't have to order them from a local dealer. You had access to be able to get some through sources you had. Exactly. So uh, uh, my brother Hodges, who was our executive vice president and sales manager, established a relationship first with the local Ford dealer, Farish Motor Company, through Milton Brown, who was then their general manager, to have a truck stocking program. Uh, subsequently, we added a Chevy program in Talboro, North Carolina, with Brinson Chevrolet. But both of these dealers would order literally dozens of truck chassis, uh, have them shipped to them, and they would store them on the yard, and we would then make them available to the bottler as a complete unit. So he would not have to order the, the chassis. Uh, we could supply everything. Of course, he would pay separately for the chassis because that gave him uh, access to local maintenance to his local Chevy or Ford dealer. So um, that was a great benefit because it sped up the process. So from the time you got the chassis in about 1965, in that time frame, until the truck was completely manufactured. I know there are a lot of factors. What was uh, an average turnaround time? Two to three months. Two normally. to three months. So, and, and that factors in backlog. Okay. So let's talk about one other thing, and that is is that uh, some of the customers you dealt with, uh, their business was seasonal. Well, all of their business was seasonal. Because in the, the winter, they didn't sell as many soft drinks or, or alcoholic beverages, beers, exactly as they right. did in the summer. Correct. So... Slow time was winter. 
Yes. And they probably didn't order as many trucks then. And we often said that if our customers had their way, <laughs> uh, we would uh, open for business the 1st of March and shut down the 1st of September. Is that, right? uh, that didn't work too well with maintaining a skilled workforce. Yes. So what we would do to, uh, to fill that gap is we would sell uh, the, we would book the order uh -huh. in the fall. Uh, and it was not difficult to persuade our butlers to buy then because their, their planning year normally ran from the fall through the end of the summer. Uh, there was no down payment, so we had to establish a system where we had a fairly substantial line of credit and we would build these truck bodies against orders uh, and store them on our yard during the winter. And then when the chassis came in uh, in the, the spring, we could then modify the chassis, mount, paint, letter the body, and deliver it to the customer when he wanted it, which was basically everyone wanted it in May. So your production line really was predicated on your ability to either have cash on hand or a line of credit to be able to develop those vehicles and have them ready and wait until your customers got their cash flow going again in the spring and summer months to be able to take delivery. Exactly, and in our case, it was a line of credit. So um, sometimes things probably got a little tight. Well, that was a major part of our business was the annual line of credit. Yeah. And the, uh, well, we, we can talk about building the Kansas plant, but that was when we ran into the problems with our line of credit. And we'll talk about that in just a minute, but I think there's something that was a game changer for you that happened um, in 1968 and uh, 67, 68. Uh, up to that time, there were a number of beverage truck manufacturers. You were one of a number of companies around the country that built them, but you built a beverage truck instead of out of steel, out of aluminum. Yes. Talk about that and tell us how you came up with that and how that impacted your business. Uh, the, let's start with the fact that uh, a soft drink or beer load is a really heavy load. Yes. And uh, it was difficult to have a, uh, a delivery vehicle that when you combined the weight of the vehicle and the payload, uh, would be legal on the highways, on a two-axle truck. Uh, the solution to that was uh, a lighter delivery unit and a heavier payload. That's what all of our bottlers wanted. But it had to be strong. It had to be strong. The, uh, the interest in aluminum for all types of transportation equipment came about from the World's Fair in New York in 1964-1965. Uh, there were a number of uh, pieces of transportation equipment and other items that were made out of aluminum. Uh, at that point, aluminum had been quite expensive, but was gradually uh, getting less expensive. Uh, in fact, uh, at one point, aluminum per pound was more than gold. Really? Uh, the top of the Washington Monument has an aluminum item on it, and it was there because it was so valuable uh, <laughs> that, that it, it was a status symbol for the Washington Monument. Really? But by the, the mid-1960s, uh, the manufacturing process for aluminum uh, became sophisticated enough that the price came down. Brought the cost down. Uh, there was interest in aluminum because of the World's Fair. Uh, our bottlers then were interested in uh, bigger payloads, lower unit weight, and there was also another factor, and that is there was a federal excise tax yes. on vehicles that had an empty weight of 13,000 pounds or more. Well, a steel beverage body was about 14,000 pounds. So it was above the federal excise tax limit, where they collected tax because you were over 13,000 pounds empty weight. Yes. Uh, we were able to reduce the weight of a beverage body by about 2,000 pounds ah. by going to aluminum. It was more expensive, 
but not outrageously more expensive. When I say more expensive, we're talking about perhaps uh, 25% more. Wow. So uh, the design for aluminum is quite different from steel. Uh, you can get aluminum that is as strong as steel, but the other properties are quite different. So it required much more sophisticated engineering, which was the strong suit of our company. Yes. Uh, and that's not, not me per se, but uh, we had a number of other very good engineers. So in the late 60s, uh, we designed really the first widely sold aluminum body in the industry. Uh, our competitors, of course, immediately tried to copy it. Uh, very few copied it successfully. And so the, uh, the demise of a number of our smaller competitors resulted from the fact that they tried to build aluminum bodies uh, and the body simply broke up after a short period of time. Well, things took off when you made the transition. I believe in about 1967 was when you started That's it. the aluminum bodies and by 1968 you weren't making steel body well, backs anymore. We, we continued to make steel but there was an, an evolution. I think mm -hmm. the last steel body we made was in the, the late 1970s but by that time we were making so few right. that uh, there was no reason to continue. It As was people not wanted them. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, it was a game changer. Yeah, it was. And business took off in a big way. So, Well, and part of what caused it to take off was in that period from 1968 until the early 70s, uh, we picked up market share because, as I mentioned, competitors that tried to build aluminum bodies uh, were not successful and they went out, went out of business. So we inherited, uh, we didn't inherit, uh, we earned their market share by building equipment that met the customer's need. You um, realized that things were growing. Uh, you were selling uh, e equipment trucks, truck bodies, beverage delivery trucks uh, in a large region all over the country. And um, you wanted to expand. Yes. You decided you would uh, start looking for a location. And you re I remember you telling me an interesting story. Um, you started traveling around the country looking for another place to locate a second plant. Yes. Transportation equipment by its nature is delivered to the customer by driving it. Uh -huh. And the delivery cost is a factor in the overall price of the unit. So with our plant in Washington, North Carolina, we were able to cover pretty much the, the East Coast as far west as perhaps the Mississippi River. But uh, as we had more and more interest in uh, from customers in the West, and of course we had more and more interest in growing, uh, we needed a manufacturing plant closer to them. And so uh, we literally drew a big oval on the, the U.S. map about where the, the ideal place for a manufacturing plant would be. And it ran from uh, northern Texas to uh, about northern Kansas, uh, from mid-state Kansas into about mid-state Arkansas and, uh, and, uh, and Missouri. So my father and I uh, began looking for a place to build a plant. Uh, in some cases, it was the State Economic Development Administration. In some cases, it was the public utilities, such as in Texas. But over a 13-month period in 1968 and 1969, uh, Dad and I visited 28 communities in that area, most of them approximately the size of Washington. Uh, we narrowed it down to two communities, uh, one in Texas, one in Kansas. Uh, at that point, we also had a, a business downturn, or maybe I should say a business leveling off. So we put the plans for a new plant on hold uh, until business picked back up, uh, which well, it did in the early 70s. And let's talk about that. So 1970s in Washington, North Carolina, there was an industrial boom. Yes. There were a number of companies that were locating here for a number of reasons. Mention some of those. Sure. Uh, it really began in, in 1965 when 
the Texas Gulf Sulphur Company built a major phosphate mining and manufacturing complex on Lee Creek uh, down the Pamlico River. And why did they build it there? Excuse me? Why did they build it in that location? Well, uh, they were mining phosphate. That's where the phosphate was. In fact, two, the two largest phosphate deposits in the country are that location. And Bartow, that, Florida. Yes. yes. So uh, this was an undeveloped and unmined uh, source of phosphate. And Texas Gulf came to town and they hired a lot of folks. They did, uh, which was a challenge for us because uh, they began paying considerably higher wages than we were paying as uh, sort of the big frog in the small pond. Yes. Uh, so we had to dramatically change uh, uh, our personnel practices, our payroll, and of course the, the productivity of our manufacturing facility to be able to pay more to attract the kind of employee we wanted and still compete with the local industries. And there were a couple of others. Hamilton Beach was yeah. manufacturing uh, blenders and other items here. How many employees did they have here? Eventually, uh, they peaked at about 1,200. But wow. We, In Washington, North Carolina. Yeah, over the period from the late 60s until the mid-70s, uh, there was uh, a tremendous industrial boom. Uh, National Spinning Company, which had been here since the late 50s, had expanded to about 1,700 employees. Texas Gulf Sulphur had 1,200. Uh, Hamilton Beach located here, and they had 11 to 1,200 employees. Uh, Flanders Filters, which is now one of the largest, maybe the largest uh, high efficiency filter manufacturer in the nation, located here about 1974. Uh, Singer Company had a division that manufactured furniture in Chakawinity, they employed 350. Stanadyne uh, manufactured automotive parts. Uh, they located here. All uh, in Little Washington. In Little Washington. Uh, Atwood and Morrill was another company that made huge valves for power plants. Uh, all of this happened in a 10 year period in a community that even with the, uh, the outlying areas was about 15,000 and a county that was less than 50,000 population. Wow, and I tell you, that put a lot of pressure on uh, companies hiring workers because there were a lot of options, and as you had mentioned, uh, for better paying jobs maybe than you were able to pay in some cases. Initially, yes. <laughs> and we made a commitment to our employees uh, at that time that if they would stay with us, uh, we could not immediately raise our pay rates to match, say, Texas Gulf. But as we improved productivity, we would improve our payroll until we would become the highest paying company locally. And we kept that pledge to our employees. It took probably between five and ten years to actually get to the, the top of the heap, but we did so. And about how many employees did you have at that time? Eventually, well, uh, eventually we peaked out at about 250 employees mm -hmm. locally. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a big employer in Washington. And when you mention all these other places, uh, Hamilton Beach with 11 to 1,200 and Texas Gulf with 1,700, uh, those are huge employers uh, at that time for any community, let alone a community of Washington whose population, as you mentioned, with even adding in the outlying areas, was about 15,000 people. Yeah. Uh, in 68, you asked the, the number of employees. I remember in 1968, we were slightly over 100. So that'll give wow. you a, a rough feel. By, the, uh, the, by 10 years, 11 years later, we were at 250. Well, with your expansion and your plant, uh, you selected a location in Kansas. Yes. To build another plant. You were the number one um, beverage truck manufacturer in the United States. Yes, we were. You were at the top, and you were not the least expensive. No, we actually, we were the most expensive. You were the most expensive. You were selling the most truck bodies. You were the most expensive. Why did people buy your trucks? Uh, quality and service. Great. Tell uh, us about that. F first of all, uh, there was no argument, even among our competitors, that we had far and away the, the best designed and the highest manufacturing quality of any truck body in the industry. In fact, many of them tried copying us and their big sales pitches is almost as good as a Hackney and cheaper. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, 
Uh, <laughs> Almost as good. So you stood behind it too. You had a pretty we, impressive we, warrant. We had a ten-year guarantee. Uh, we had a mobile or had several mobile service facilities where we would be able to go to a customer's plant and help him with preventive maintenance and make repairs that he might need made. Uh, we had a service manual. Uh, we uh, had a uh, uh, sort of a dog and pony show that we took around where we trained fleet managers uh, in maintenance of our equipment. And the combination of, of all of this, the quality, the guarantee, uh, enabled us to sell at a premium price because uh, if, if a truck body, uh, well, we guaranteed it for 10 years. But in point of fact, uh, there are Hackney truck bodies rolling around that are 25 years old. Yeah. So uh, other than minor refurb and repainting, uh, a bottler could pretty well rely on using a Hackney truck body for 20 years. Uh, whereas our competitors, they were lucky to get 10 years. So if even though your vehicle was more expensive, it was much more economical in the long term. Sure, 10, pay 10% 10 more and get 100% more life. Uh, that really wasn't a very difficult uh, uh, deal to sell. Pretty good sales pitch. Now, you know, the economy has strange ways of uh, affecting business, and it affected uh, your customers. Um, soft drinks uh, depended heavily upon the commodity of sugar. Yes. Because a soft drink, uh, believe it or not, had 12 teaspoons of sugar in a 12-ounce serving, which is a lot. So it took a lot of sugar to make uh, the regular soft drinks. And when the price of sugar went up, um, that put some stress on your customers, who were, many of them, uh, the soft drink folks. And that's exactly what happened. Well, in, in the mid-70s, commodity prices soared. What happened? What, how did that work? Well, first of all, uh, to expand on what you said, at that time, the only uh, sweetener used in sugared soft drinks, which were the vast majority of those sold. Uh, at that time, Diet yes. was not that big a deal in the early 70s. There was one pound of sugar per case of soft drinks. That's oh my gosh. 20, 24 bottle case of A soft pound drinks. of sugar for 24 cases. And sugar had been relatively stable for a long time. In 1972, in the spring, Sugar was $12 per hundred weight, which is about the price it had been. It fluctuated generally from $8 to $12. Sugar began rising uh, for no good reason. Uh, one of the problems with commodities is that uh, it tends to be more emotional than practical. Uh, by November of 1972, sugar was, was $72 per hundred weight, six times what it was uh, only about eight or ten months earlier. Uh, our bottlers were in panic. Uh, and when, well, th they cut back on ordering equipment because they could see themselves going out of business. Yeah. When our customers have a 10% decline in sales, <clears throat> they don't order 10% less beverage bodies. They order 100% less beverage bodies. They don't bodies. buy any, yeah. They don't buy anything. So, uh, a couple of things happened with our customers. The first was that they began uh, using a different sweetener, HFCS, high fructose corn sweetener, which is now the primary sweetener in soft drinks. Uh, the second thing they did of necessity is they raised the prices. Uh, that turned out to be a blessing and a curse. Uh, the, the blessing was they found out that the demand for their product was not as elastic as they thought it was. When they raised the price, people still kept buying soft drinks. So, Particularly when it was hot. Absolutely. And in the southeast, when it gets to be around May through September, it gets pretty warm, and you've got a lot of agriculture. Yes. And you have people working out in the fields, working outside. People drink a lot of drinks. Yes. So by the 1973 and perhaps early 1974, bottlers uh, business was doing very well. The price of sugar collapsed uh, around December of 1972 
And within a year, it was back to $8 a hundredweight. So you can imagine going from 72 to 8. Well, of course, our bottlers did not uh, reduce their price. So they had raised their prices for soft yes. drinks to reflect their increased cost of production, their raw ingredients. But when the price went back down, their margins increased and they didn't lower their prices. Exactly. And so that was a great opportunity for them to upgrade their fleets. So with the the advent of the new aluminum body and all of the advantages that it brought, uh, longer life, lower excise tax and the like, uh, there was a buying boom in the early and mid-70s, uh, which uh, benefited us, and that was part of the reason for the timing of the Kansas plant. And the Kansas plant became profitable much faster than you had anticipated. Yes, the, the rule of thumb was always it took three years to break even in a new manufacturing plant. And as with many, we struggled in the first year, but by the, the end of the second year, we had broken even. Wow. Unfortunately, uh, we had difficulties with our financial institution uh, because they had uh, loaned us, well, they had uh, financed an SBA loan on the Washington plant, which gave us some working capital to begin building the Kansas plant. Uh, the actual uh, cost of the Kansas plant construction was financed by an industrial revenue bond in Kansas. But of course, the company had to use uh, its own money to finance the startup, uh, the initial inventory, and the like. Uh, the irony was about the time that we broke even, our financial institution got nervous and uh, didn't want to continue to uh, extend us the seasonal working capital loan that they had been extending in the past. So you had the same financial institution for your SBA loan yes. as your line of credit. Yes. And uh, unfortunately, with that many eggs in one basket, they decided that, uh, you know, uh, that might be problematic. So you started looking for a new financial relationship. Yes. Tell us what that process was. Sure. Well, the uh, the financial institution, uh, instead of an open seasonal credit line, wanted to uh, do what is known as factoring, that is, pledge our inventory as collateral against the working capital loan. Yep. It also was, at that point, 19, late 1974, early 75, and uh, long-term money had dried up. Uh, you, could, you could still get short-term working capital, but it was very difficult to finance a home or finance the, uh, the building assets of a company. So uh, if our company was going to continue to grow, we needed uh, a different uh, banking arrangement. Well, you needed more capital. You now had two plans. Yes. You had just in easy terms, at least twice as many, uh, twice as much demand for short-term money to buy inventory, to build trucks. Um, you needed to find another financial yes. partner. So I began looking. Uh, I went to, to New York, to Philadelphia, to Baltimore. Uh, also went to Charlotte, to what was then NCNB, the predecessor of Bank of America. And uh, we made our presentation to them, and they expressed interest in taking over our line of credit. Uh, so they said, give us a couple of weeks to study your numbers, uh, and we'll get back to you. Well, well, they came back with an interesting analysis. Uh, they did. Two weeks later, I went to Charlotte, and uh, their credit manager, John Pipkin, I remember fondly, uh, said, we've studied your numbers, and we don't think you're asking for enough money. Now, that's kind of unusual. You, you go to a bank, yes. tell them that you need a line credit of X, and they said, you guys aren't asking for enough. Exactly. And why did they, why did they tell you that? What well, was the rationale? Well, they, they said, we've, we've looked at the numbers. Uh, why, why didn't you ask for what you need? And we said, well, our relationship with our previous financial institution was we would skinny down the, the working capital 
uh, request as low as we could go, and they loan us about 80% of it. And so John said, we at NCNB don't do business that way. You know, we, we are in all the way, we are here to help our, our customers. And so they ended up giving us the line of credit we needed, and of course, the problem that we had in transferring the line of credit was the SBA loan on the facilities. And NCNB said, we'll loan you a bridge loan to take them out until you can find other long-term financing for your ass assets. So that, was a, that happened in 1975, and that was a, a key point in our being able to take advantage of this uh, business boom in the beverage industry. Because you needed to have the capital to expand and sell more units. And to build the units and hold them until the trucks came Exactly, in. and you couldn't do that if you had a skinny down line of credit that did not allow for sufficient growth. Exactly. Wow. Well, I see two things that were big changers here. Changing to aluminum. Yes. You, many people could no longer compete with you. Finding a new financial relationship. Yes. That allowed you to grow and take advantage of the marketplace. Uh, you were still the number one uh, beverage truck broadie company in the United States uh, and uh, continuing to expand. But those were major things. And then something interesting happened in 1976. Jimmy Carter became president. And during the Carter administration, we had some financial changes. Oh, well, mostly we, <laughs> we had runaway inflation. Exactly. Uh, or stagflation is sometimes. No, it wasn't stagflation. It was runaway inflation. <laughs> was uh, runaway. Anyone that... Uh, they tried building uh, or financing a home uh, in the late 1970s mm -hmm. uh, was looking at 12 to 14 percent interest. interest rates. Yeah. Uh, inflation was running 12 to 14 percent per year. And uh, everyone was raising prices. We had to raise prices because all of our raw materials were going up. Uh, and we, of course, tried to keep our employees abreast of of inflation with, uh, with wage increases. And our customers were similarly raising prices. But uh, I think we learned from that that, uh, again, the price for truck bodies was not as elastic as, as we thought. So uh, we were able to, to keep pace with, uh, with the cost of, of living, uh, which made the company very profitable. And again, when inflation came back down during the Reagan administration, uh, that left us still in, in uh, a very good position uh, business-wise, profit-wise. So you had mentioned in 1965, when you became the chief operating officer of the company, that you were building a few hundred units a year. After you got your plant going in Kansas with your multiple operations, how many units were you producing in the mid-1970s? By the mid to late 1970s, when the Kansas plant was fully online, we were up 2,000, 2,500 units per year. Per year. So uh, 10, 10 fold or better yes. in, a, in a relatively short 10-year period of time. That's, that's pretty good growth. Yes. And I became the CEO in 1970. <clears throat> Again, uh, <laughs> a, uh, my father's flair for the dramatic, <clears throat> uh, his father... My grandfather had died in uh, the fall of 1969. And then Dad's younger brother uh, passed away from uh, metastatic uh, lung cancer uh, a year later in the fall of 1970. And I think Dad began feeling his mortality and uh, wanted to uh, quit working day to day and do some things that he'd always wanted to do, like fish for Marlin. So in the fall of 1970, he announced that he was stepping down as CEO and that I would be CEO henceforth. So what position did your brother Hodges take at that time? Did his position change? No. Uh, well, Hodges had always uh, headed the sales operation. Yes. Uh, at, when I was, became C, uh, CEO, I was president and chief operating okay. officer. Dad remained chairman of the board. Right. And uh, Hodges was executive vice president for sales and marketing. And I might add, too, that uh, starting in the 70s, uh, our company 
behaved as if we were a public company. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we had a board of directors of nine members, uh, the four brothers, my father, and we had four outside directors who were all uh, business people, attorneys, or the like, who could bring some knowledge to the company and could, uh, as I've often said, help the family keep our heads screwed on right. So that, uh, I think, also was a, a key to our business operating professionally. You, um, with your success, you started to look at other opportunities. Uh, you looked at some other companies. Uh, we won't go into all of those, but I think it's interesting that uh, in 1985, you purchased Loadmaster, and uh, that is a garbage truck manufacturing company. Talk a little bit about that. We as we realized that there was only so much more that the beverage body industry could grow, uh, we needed to branch out. And so we identified a few areas that we thought were growth industries for the future. One was energy development, one was environmental management, one was conservation of natural resources. We figured those were all growth industries. So we began looking at things that were compatible with our expertise in one of those areas, and one was garbage trucks, which obviously were environmental management, uh, and as recycling grew, uh, reclamation of natural resources could be a part of that. So we had the opportunity to buy uh, a company in Culpeper, Virginia, called Loadmaster Corporation, that made a line of uh, garbage trucks, garbage collection trucks, uh, in 1984, and we purchased that company. And you have educated me on uh, garbage collection trucks. There are three different types. There are. <laughs> Tell people about that. The, the company that we bought, uh, Loadmaster, was the rear loading truck, which still is the primary truck. That That's the one that comes down my street. Yes, uh, it has a, uh, a rear tailgate. Mm -hmm. they, uh, they empty the trash can in the rear tailgate. Uh, it sweeps it into the, the body and compresses it because uh, landfills charge by the truckload, not by the weight. Right. So the more dense the load... The tighter you can pack it. The, the, better, the better off. And the, the, the... Well, to answer your question about the other types, uh, there is a front loader, which primarily are the larger units. Uh, it has forks uh, that pick the unit up from in front of the truck, lift it up over, and dump it into the top of yeah, the The dumpsters the that you see behind commercial yes. operations. And then the third type is the automated side loader. And we're beginning to see more of those where you roll your uh, large garbage truck out to the curb, and it picks it up from the side of the truck, uh, dumps it into the truck, and the compactor works a different way. Yeah, it, and it only requires one person. The person that drives the truck also from yes. the inside of the truck operates the loading mechanism. So instead of a driver and two helpers yes. loading your garbage uh, containers into the rear loading truck, uh, this uh, cuts down on the employees and is another efficient way for that to happen. Yes, and the thing that attracted us, especially to Loadmaster, is that, uh, first of all, it used lower pressure hydraulics, which meant less maintenance, and it also uh, compacted more densely than any of our competitors' trucks, which meant that you could pack more garbage in a Loadmaster uh, and only pay for one trip to the landfill. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. known as a tipping fee. Ah, much more economical. Yes. Well, I think that's interesting that you did that, but I want to talk about another area in the 80s that you got into, and those are emergency vehicles. Yeah, actually, uh, yes, the late 80s. Uh, it, it began uh, with a phone call from the uh, fire chief at the Marion County Fire Department, which is Salem, Oregon. Uh, and w his request or his question was, do you folks build custom truck bodies? We said, absolutely, because every beverage body is pretty much custom. And what we discovered is that the mission of fire departments had been changing. Uh, before, fire departments just put out fires. So they had extension ladder trucks, 
and they had pumpers that pumped water on the fire. But as awareness grew for hazardous materials, uh, there was nobody to shoulder that load, and so the, uh, the task got uh, shunted off to fire departments. Uh, so fire departments developed a need for a very wide range of equipment to service everything from car wrecks that spilled antifreeze to uh, firefighters that had to go into uh, uh, fires where hazardous materials were, uh, were an issue. Uh, they needed a cargo truck. We discovered that uh, fire departments had been uh, using secondhand beverage bodies to carry this equipment. Yeah, they were customizing them for their own needs because all the compartments, they could put this equipment in there. Yes, so the fire chief in, uh, in Oregon said he had an idea for what he needed that was not exactly like a beverage body, uh, but was very close in basic design. So we manufactured one for him. Uh, again, word of mouth spread in the fire industry. We ended up with the next two made for the Boston area, one in Woburn, Massachusetts, uh, and one in Waltham. So you're in the fire truck business. Now let's give credit where credit's due here, Jim. The Salem, Oregon fire chief became acquainted with you because you had a West Coast salesman. We did. And he was doing his job. He was. He, uh, <laughs> uh, when, when we got the inquiry from the Salem, Oregon fire chief, we had uh, our regional sales manager lived in the Sacramento, California area, in Roseville, California. So he went up and called on the fire chief, and he's the one that booked the order yeah. and really began the process of our making emergency vehicles. So you're a nationwide spread of hiring the best salespeople you could, getting them out there, making calls, gave you an opportunity to kind of, you know, stip, stick your toe in the water with a new business, and that was to make uh, fire equipment. How did that turn out? Yeah, well... Uh, it is now the, uh, the the primary profit center here at Washington. For Hackney Manufacturing. Yes. The, uh, initially, when we built the, the first of the, the fire units, uh, we did the, the truck body and then all of the uh, related equipment that needed to go on the, uh, the unit. Uh, everything from a generator to floodlights to... Uh, uh, shelving that uh, th that carried the other equipment, uh, we had that done aftermarket. We we quickly realized that if we were going to be in the fire apparatus business, it needed to be one-stop shopping. So we set up uh, a plant that could do everything, uh, and they became very very sophisticated. Um, a number of the units that we made had a command center on the rear, which is a rolling office. Uh, it had a built-in weather station, uh, a computer, and we're talking about 1990, so computers were not as sophisticated. That was a big deal. But as they, uh, the government at that time was beginning to require what is known as a, a material safety data sheet, uh, and they, uh, a copy had to be filed with the local fire department by an industry that had hazardous materials. So when one of our units would roll to the fire, along with the pumper and the, the ladder truck, uh, they had an office in the rear. They would pull up the, the material safety data sheet. Uh, the weather station would read the wind direction, speed, and humidity, and they would be able to project the hazardous materials uh, down, downwind plume so that they would know what they would have to evacuate. So that by the time they arrived at the fire with our unit, uh, they had all of the information they knew they needed to actually fight that specific fire. Now, and I think it's very interesting, Jim, that these command centers were very sophisticated uh, trucks. Yes. Um, you've described them in a very short period of time and we can understand what they've done. But how long did it take you to make a command center? Normal process was uh, from start to finish probably two months, uh, then add the backlog to that. So it was, it was a period of time. Uh, it wasn't just uh, a walk in the park. It was a very specialized process. Yeah. 
a lot of electrical yes. uh, equipment, electronic components. Virtually all of them had generators. Uh, we had the command center with the computer and the weather station. Uh, it the the last five years I worked, I worked primarily with the emergency vehicle uh, part of the company. And I have to say that it was actually one of the most enjoyable uh, times of my entire work career because firefighters are wonderful people. They like to help people or they'd be in some other line of work. Uh, so uh, I would make calls with our distributors and uh, with this uh, the sales manager that we hired to succeed me when I retired uh, and it was a wonderful experience and in fact when we would display at uh, fire conventions and there were three major fire conventions uh, the, the international fire chiefs show that moved around uh, the fire department inspectors workshop that initially was in Cincinnati moved to Indianapolis and then the California show which was in the uh, the Sacramento area uh, but uh, it was not really practical to drive a fully equipped demonstrator to say Sacramento California no. <laughs> uh, and Sa California because we began in Oregon became a very good uh, state for density of our equipment. It was a good market, wasn't it? It was, but we literally had fire departments that would pull a truck out of service for the three or four days for the convention and let us have it in our booth at the exhibition center and actually would have one of their uh, firefighters with the truck to look out for their equipment. And he was a much better salesman than we could be yes. because he can answer all of the questions that other firefighters had. So it, uh, it really was a, a, a great experience and it's turned out to be a, a wonderful addition to the product line. So Jim, what, uh, what, what is your market share? What was your market share at that time of this type of fire equipment, do you think? We were actually about the only manufacturer initially that made that type of equipment That's because everything else was just re-outfitting used beverage bodies. You were the go-to company to have a command center. We were, and we had two challenges at that point because fire departments tend to be a bit provincial and uh, our unit was referred to as the beer truck or the pop truck rather than a fire truck. <laughs> so we had... Uh, <laughs> in the early years, two uh, goals for our marketing campaign. The first was to portray the Hackney unit as a fire truck rather than a pop truck. Uh -huh. And then second, knowing that our competitors were going to quickly get in on the, uh, the action, uh, to establish Hackney as the emergency vehicle to buy just as the Hackney beverage body was the beverage body to buy. And you were good marketers. You, uh, uh, not only with the fire industry, but you were in the major, major trade magazines with uh, very nicely done display ads for the beverage industry. Yes. You knew the importance not only of great marketing, but you also invested heavily in having the best sales force you could have. We did. And our, that paid dividends. Yes. Our, all of our salesmen <clears throat> were extremely well compensated. In fact, when I was CEO, we had three salesmen that made more than I did because of the commission structure. And I've often said to people, my only regret is that all of our salesmen didn't make more than I did. Yes, because that meant your sales would have been up. Yes, and of course, <laughs> my, I, I had an ownership position. Absolutely. The so you had a vested interest. Let's, um, so your, your command center's L.A., New York, San Francisco, biggest, biggest markets in the country, yes. that, those were Hackney vehicles. They were. If you were from Washington, North Carolina, and were familiar and drove past the Hackney manufacturing facility as well as your other facilities and went to New York and there was a fire, you would see Hackney on the side of that truck. You would indeed. You guys made them. Yes. And we're going to talk about that a little more in just a second, but let's talk about what happened in 1990. In 1990... Uh, we ended up selling the company to an investment partnership. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, I ceased to be the CEO after the, the new investment group took over. 
Uh, the contract was that I would continue working for five more years. That was part of the deal, as would Hodges. Uh, the, at that point, the, uh, the emergency vehicle business uh, was very small. We had only manufactured a few. Uh, the new owners asked me if I would do an analysis to see if it was a business that we could make money in. Uh, after I looked at it, my response was, yes, we can make money in it if we treat it like a business rather than like a stepchild. Now, that sounds awfully simple, but tell us what you meant by that. Well, it's not simple. It was the occasional unit being run down the beverage body line and uh, either going to outside contractors to help out, outfit it or have some folks in our maintenance staff uh, do what they could uh, to outfit it. Uh, and uh, the sophistication of these units uh, was growing at that point. So we really needed to set up almost a separate business. A dedicated business. So with, with its own office staff, its own sales force, and its own manufacturing facility that was separate and apart from the beverage body manufacturing facility. Now, let's talk about 1990 again because uh, that's when things changed because a five-generation owned, family-owned business from the 1850s with uh, Hackney Buggy Works and streetcars and all kinds of fun things that they made all the way up to 1990, not very many five-generation family-owned businesses comes to an end. You told me something interesting, and let's go back to that again. So in 1965, you became the chief operating officer of Hackney Brothers, several no, different names. Hackney Brothers. Yes. Uh, Hackney and Sons. Hackney and Sons, excuse me. Several yeah. different names in here, and I am... <laughs> Not as good with those yeah, as right. you Hackney are. Brothers was the Wilson company. Before, that was in Wilson, so Hackney mm -hmm. and Sons. And you were doing maybe a couple of hundred uh, bodies up through that time. What were your gross sales in 1965, approximately? About a million dollars. And when you sold the company in 1990, what were the gross sales? Uh, approaching 50 million. So you went from a million to 50 million in 25 years. Yes. I think that's pretty good. That's quite an accomplishment. Well, uh, the factor in terms of the sale of the company was in 1990, my father was 73 years old. He owned 55% of the company and he wanted to cash in. <laughs> So uh, those of us who owned 45% didn't, didn't get to vote, uh -huh. so to speak. So uh, that was really primarily a, uh, a decision that Dad made. Well, uh, and he had the right to. He yes. Was, uh, he was the majority stockholder. But as you had mentioned, uh, you stayed on and your brother Hodges stayed on. And your task was to continue to work and to uh, not only to analyze and report on whether in fact the emergency uh, uh, vehicle business was a good business, which you determined it was, if it was run as a business. That was kind of the jumping off point of getting more serious and making that the primary focus of the company. Your well, brother Hodges, was job was to develop the international business. Yes, and I might add in the emergency vehicle end of it, of course, my job was to almost create it from scratch. Yes. We had had it, but uh, to create a, an ongoing business. Uh, and it, it went very well. I mean, we, we had a great team, and uh, my aspiration was not to remain with the company beyond my five years. Uh, my wife and I were very much into sailing, and we planned to get on a sailboat after I retired and sail off for seven months to the Florida Keys and the Bahamas. So with uh, less than a year to go and the business, the emergency vehicle business doing very well, uh, I went to our then president and suggested that we find someone who could succeed me and would have a reasonable overlap so that they wouldn't wait till the last minute and say, hey, can you stick around for a few more months? <laughs> you wanted to go sailing. <laughs> so, so we managed to do that. And uh, so the transition went very smoothly. And the individual that we hired 
stayed for 20 more years as the uh, wow. the manager of the emergency vehicle end of the company. Uh, going back to Hodges, uh, at that time they asked Hodges to uh, investigate the establishment of an international sales uh, arm of the company. We had almost no international sales at that point. Uh, a few things a few fortuitous things were happening at that point. Uh, the Iron Curtain came down. Uh, we're talking about 1990. Uh, Eastern Europe was uh, was opened up to business, you know, no longer uh, controlled by the communist. And so Coke and Pepsi were uh, interested in expanding uh, into Eastern Europe and other areas. Uh, they realized at that time that one of the mistakes that they had made many, many years before when they expanded into other countries is they let the local bottlers buy any type of delivery equipment that they wanted. Uh, some of it was really very crude. I mean, flatbed bodies, uh, uh, almost horses and buggies. Uh, the Coke and Pepsi uh, decided that uh, they were going to insist that as a condition for a franchise in companies like Poland and Hungary and the like, that the, their bottler would have to buy modern, efficient beverage delivery equipment. And of course that was hackney equipment in terms of being the top of the line. Absolutely. Uh, Hodges, as our sales and marketing uh, VP, had established a very good relationship with uh, all of the top executives of all of the major bottlers, and for that matter, beer distributors. So uh, it was a great, a great time. Uh, the, the new owners established a separate incorporated company, uh, Hackney International. Uh, Hodges became the president of Hackney International and uh, began uh, establishing uh, uh, relationships with bottlers in foreign countries. And shall we talk about uh, how he did that? Yes, I think that's very interesting. Uh, the equipment that we made was not patented. Uh, it was purely manufacturing technique. Uh, we made it better than anyone else. The design was not patented so it could be copied by anyone. But as I mentioned earlier, uh, our early competitors in aluminum truck bodies tried to copy it and they weren't very successful. Uh, so. Uh, we realized, uh, Hodges realized, that as uh, we uh, expanded into uh, other countries, uh, it would be fairly easy for uh, a local truck body manufacturer to uh, at least reasonably copy our unit. There was no legal protection. Uh, also, the truck chassis that it was going to be mounted on would have to be altered in Poland or wherever. Uh, they couldn't ship it to the United States for us to, uh, to do the chassis modification and then ship it back. So uh, what Hackney International did uh, was two things. First of all, we trademarked the, the name Hackney uh, in every country that we were operating. So at least a competitor couldn't copy the name. Uh, second, uh, Hodges picked the best truck body manufacturer in that nation, the one that would have been the most formidable competitor if we tried to start from scratch there, and made them their partner. Uh, the plant here in Washington developed uh, a knockdown truck body manufacturing kit, in other words, the beverage body uh, in components, uh, so that they could ship the components to our new partner in some other country. Uh, we brought their employees here to train them in how to put it together, uh, how to modify the chassis, uh, and that business took off. And uh, I know you'll be talking with Hodges, but uh, at one point uh, Hackney International was selling in uh, 60 or more countries with manufacturing facilities in quite a few. Well, all over the world, and yes. uh, not just Europe, but Russia, South yes. America. Uh, Far East, all over the place, and uh, pretty impressive uh, uh, that that happened. So, 1990, you sell the company. 1995, 
I retire. You get a chance to retire. Something happened that I want you to tell us about that you know about, and you may not have been involved in the day-to-day -day operation, but it was um, September 11th, 2001. Yes. And um, we had a terrorist attack in New York. We where, did indeed. Um, we thought that it was going to be a single attack. We didn't know that they were so well organized, but a plane uh, hit the South Tower of the World Trade Center and um, it was on fire. Yes. And uh, one of your customers, the New York Fire Department. FDNY, Fire Department uses, of New York. Who use your command vehicles and others, uh, very efficient organization on the scene within a few minutes set up command in the south in the other tower because it had not been hit and they really weren't anticipating there would be any other problem but there was well what they weren't anticipating was the collapse of the buildings yes <clears throat> the fire was uh, was at the top but as it turned out the the tire the fire uh, weakened the structure above which collapsed and then it became a cascading thing where the the structure below couldn't support yes. the the collapse of uh, the upper structure on it, so it, it came down uh, and buried everything underneath it, uh, underneath it in the street, uh, which, which included, included the New York Fire Department's <coughs> command vehicle manufactured by Hackney Manufacturing. Yes, and in fact, we've got some great photos, uh, sad photos of them pulling the command vehicle out of the rubbish, and it's just devastated you can see what it is but it's crushed what happened the unit that the fire department of new york had of course was a command vehicle that carried all of the uh, auxiliary equipment that they needed in addition to the firefighting equipment uh, and the loss of that equipment was was devastating they needed to replace it immediately and so what the company did was uh, look at units that were uh, in construction that were similar to what FDNY, uh, Fire Department of New York, had used, got permission from the customers to whom those units had been sold to divert their unit to New York. And of course, as you might imagine, they readily agreed. Uh, the company worked around the clock. Uh, we, you shut everything down. All the production lines were shut down and your total focus was, on was to manufacture uh, units to replace, replace the ones re damaged yep. the, by the New York Fire Department during the 9-11 attacks. Yeah, there were two of those, I think. Mm -hmm. And it, it was an around-the-clock deal, so what would normally be a two-month process, uh, even working expeditiously, became about a week, week-and-a-half process. Got it done in that short period of time. Yes. There was one other complication. After the September 11th attack, in a very wise and prudent decision, um, the government closed the airway, the airspaces to all air traffic except for some military vehicles for a period of about a week. Yes. You couldn't fly parts in. No. Not on a private plane, not on a commercial plane. They had to be driven here and you had suppliers that contributed to these units, multiple suppliers, how did you get those parts in to be able to complete this project within less than two weeks? At that point, we had our own uh, fleet of, deliver of uh, transport trucks that we used to shuttle back and forth between the Kansas plant and the North Carolina plant. So we had our own vehicles that we could pick up some of the parts, but also our suppliers uh, were extremely helpful, and they used their own fleet of trucks to bring us the parts that were needed. They brought you the parts because they couldn't fly them to you, and there was such a strain on uh, all of the delivery services. FedEx and all these companies, they depend upon airplanes to move their freight from place to place, and then trucks. That really was no help to you because they couldn't get anything by plane. It had to be driven, and your suppliers stopped what they were doing, and they got you the parts you needed. You worked 24 hours a day, and in Washington, North Carolina, you built them a new command center or two new command centers 
within less than a two-week period. Yes. And, of course, the entire country was sympathetic to what yeah. had happened to New York, and there was nothing that we could do that we wouldn't do to help the people of New York. Yes. That's not the first time that you had shut your plant down to come to the rescue of uh, a customer uh, in need. Uh, in 1975, the Pepsi-Cola plant in Kenston burnt to the ground. And uh, two days after that happened, um, tell us what your company did. Well, first of all, their fleet was in the building. Yeah, so it all burned down. So when, when the building collapsed from the fire, yeah, it uh, collapsed on top of the fleet, or the gas tanks in, the, in their fleet pretty well destroyed anything else that was still left. They so, incinerated everything. The Pepsi trucks were gone. The bottling equipment was gone. The product was gone. A total, everything was gone. And, of course, the Pepsi company in Kinston had... Uh, others in their family that were in the bottling business, so they could at least get product yes. from the other plants by running uh, extra hours, but they couldn't with the fleet because the delivery had to be during normal business hours. And luckily, they had a competitor across the street, Harvey Hines, who was the Coca-Cola bottler, a good competitor, but a friend of their family, and he had a few old Coke trucks and for a very few days, they were delivering Pepsi on Coke trucks. But but tell us about your dad, and I believe your brother and Hodges, Hodges yes. uh, went to Kinston one or two days after the fire. What happened? Exactly. Uh, and we were willing to do whatever it took to help the Minji's family. And uh, so uh, they struck a deal. Hodges and dad came back. We shut the plant down. And very much like we did later for the fire department of New York, uh, our entire entire output uh, was being built for the Kinston Pepsi Cola plant. Well, uh, that's pretty impressive. And uh, when you got all those trucks done, and as you told us earlier, your manufacturing process was to uh, manufacture it, to letter it. So yes. when when it went down the road. <laughs> You knew it was a Pepsi truck because it had Pepsi all over. Yes, and fortunately, by that time, we already had the uh, the in-stock truck program that yes. we talked about earlier. Yes. So we were able to draw from the trucks in inventory. They were right there. At uh, either Farish or Brinson. And we manufactured the, uh, the truck bodies and put on them, so we were able to get them back in the delivery business and a matter of a few weeks. Yeah, less than two weeks, and had a parade of new Pepsi trucks coming down Vernon Avenue for delivery to Hoyt Menges. Yes. Very impressive. Very impressive. Um, your brother has, Hodges, has retired. Yes. Uh, he spent another 25 years, I believe, uh, with the company. Uh, retired in 2015, so he was there from 1990 till 2015. Yes. You uh, went sailing and have uh, uh, gotten into some other uh, things that you've been working and, and accomplishing, and uh, the company today uh, does over $100 million yes. in sales. So a million dollars in sales from 1965, a five-generation family-owned business to today, based in Washington, North Carolina, a $100 million a year manufacturing business. Um, pretty impressive. What else do we need to know about the Hackney family? What are you doing today? What's your next challenge? Uh, people ask me what I do. Yeah. Uh, and my answer is I work full time for charity. <laughs> uh, and a after I retired, uh, of course, we were gone for seven months. Yeah. You did. You fulfilled that promise to yourself and your wife. You went sailing. Good for you. Well, we, the original plan, my wife and I had uh, learned to ski when we were in our late 30s. Yeah. And so the original plan for retirement was to spend a winter cruising to the South Seas and then a winter skiing. 
And we did two cycles of that. Uh, we, we went for seven months in 95, 96. Uh, the winter of 96, 97, we went to Colorado and spent a couple of months skiing. Went back for another seven month cruise uh, that next year and then back to Colorado and we decided we liked skiing in the winter better than sailing in the winter because even the the northern Bahamas are still cool and windy in the in the uh, winter. <clears throat> so we moved our sailing trips to the spring and early summer to the Chesapeake and now for 22 of the last 23 years we spent the winters in Colorado. I began doing some consulting uh, in the in-between times and the consulting that I did was uh, with companies who had had a, a falling out with their, their major lending institution who needed someone to help them put together a new game plan that would be acceptable to, uh, to the financial institutions so that the financial institutions would renew their line of credit. Mm -hmm. And I've been through the, the credit problems you before. Have. <laughs> <clears throat> so, uh, and the nice thing about that was the engagement was typically a 90-day engagement. Yeah. So I was able to do that uh, when I wasn't sailing or skiing. Yeah. Uh, and that, I had the consulting business until 08 when the Great Recession began and then uh, there were a lot of clients that needed help, but they couldn't afford it. Mm -hmm. So I've been fully retired since 2008. Uh, since then, uh, I play trumpet on a band. Uh, and this is not a commercial band. We don't do any for pay gigs. Uh, we play at nursing homes, schools, churches. Uh, we did, for example, the, uh, the kickoff for the Pitt County Senior Games last spring, we did the Memorial Day uh, concert for Greenville's Memorial Day uh, at the Town Common. Uh, the most unusual concert that we did was at the Greenville Homeless Shelter. Uh, our band is based in Greenville. So we do that. I'm president of the uh, Shepherd Cancer Center Foundation. Uh, I'm still on the executive board of the Boy Scouts. Uh, I've continued to be active in the State Society of Professional Engineers, of which I'm a past president, uh, and I'm a Rotarian, very active in the, the Rotary Club. So there are some of the things that I continue to do, very active in our church. I'm a licensed lay preacher in the Episcopal Church, uh, and uh, like most people in a small church, do a lot of other things besides that. So uh, there's no problem in staying busy. Well, uh, Jim Hackney, we're so pleased that you uh, took time to spend with us today to uh, record a lot of the history of uh, particularly uh, your immediate family and your involvement and your great accomplishments uh, with uh, the various aspects of, uh, of the Hackney Company. And we thank you for being a North Carolina trailblazer. My pleasure.